Look at Albert, to the Albert Bath Racecourse with uh, commentator John Hunt. Thank you very much, John, for agreeing Thanks to talk to us. No problem. Um, can we start from the beginning, really? You're an early interest in sport. How did you get into this uh, business? I became completely obsessed with it, um, the same way as my dad did before me. And of course, my dad was a big friend and role model, you know, through early life. And, you know, we both love football, following West Ham in particular. Uh, but dad, from an early, early stage, clearly loved his horse racing. I remember him crying when Dickie Pittman got caught in the Grand National on Crisp. And I, th I can remember thinking as a young kid there, thinking, God, you know, like, how, can, how can that race have such a big impact on someone as big and strong as my dad? And that really was a changing point, I think, for me in that Grand National. And thereafter, dad loved his race and we, we went as often as we could, based around Epsom and Sandown. And then uh, as he... As he got promoted we had, we had to move so we saw a few of the race courses in the Midlands as well thereafter so yeah that was one real happy tale but 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 almost exclusively through my dad I'm pretty sure if dad's interest what well, hadn't been there in the first instance I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have gone down that line stuck to tune in West Ham every weekend rather than going racing okay what a lot of people might not know is that before you Willing to commentate, etc. You're a policeman. Can you tell us how that happened? Well, I had a few jobs. I had a few jobs, Simon. I was in news agency to, to start with. Then I went nurse training, which I absolutely loved, but was very, very keen to get back down to the, the London area. We were up in the Midlands at the time. And um, yeah, then a pal of mine from school had joined the police and was loving it, same sort of age. And I thought, you know what, 18 years old, 19 just maybe then. Um, be great to go down there, single boy, have a, have a bit of money in your pocket. Why not give it a go? And I gave it a go and I, lo I absolutely loved it, Simon, to be honest. So I really love that. I'm still in touch with a good few of the lads from those days. I was based in in Kilburn in northwest London, which was a very lively part of the world to work in. Lots, lots going on there. And uh, absolutely loved it. But then I got a complete uh, stroke of luck in terms of the racing, in that. Um, my wife saw a, she was from Wheelstone, again, Northwest London, and she'd seen in the local paper a, an advertisement in the, in the Harrow Observer for a trainee commentator with Labrooks who were based in Rainers Lane. Um, it, was, it was for no money, but it was a great change. And I went to see my boss in the, in the police force, at, the chief inspector's dead now, Alan Bertram, but a great man. And he, and he said, look, if it doesn't work out, give us a ring and you can come back. So age then what 21 22 i didn't have any real gamble to take it wasn't it was an, it was a win-win gamble basically and uh, away we went had a great had a great had a great few few years there not sure i want to still be doing it at 54 let, rather than 24 but um uh, great times um but happily it i moved on to great times as well in racing so you must have felt you had an aptitude for it before you dropped the police though what the the racing for the, the commentating yeah i suppose i remember me thinking I remember me thinking, you know, going racing with Dad. I can remember moments where this is going to sound this is going to sound bad, but you might be at the races, hear a commentator say something, and you'd say, "Well, I'm not sure about that." Do you know what I mean? Or is he going well? I'm not sure he is. You know that sort of thing. You know. And I remember always being able to pick the horses out that Dad was following in particular as a youngster. You know, this is back at home off the telly. He'd say, "Where are we?" I say, "There we are. Look, red and white. Yeah, we're there." So. I could always identify, it was only really when I went for that trainee job that um, I realised I could sort of do it as a commentator as well. So, And obviously Labricks gave me loads and loads of practice, dog racing, and, and when I got my job at SIS in the early 90s, they, they, they gave me a, basically a whole year um, on course training, which was like an unbelievable thing to do. But happily there was myself and Richard Hoyles, Ian Bartley was already fully fledged by then as well but um, Mark Johnson very much on the scene as well so there were a lot of us the same sort of age coming through at the same sort of time but I remember Richard and I Richard Hoyles and I we, you know we, we sort of trained through that first year together the, the ups and downs of that but it was all a, a really protected sort of environment we were we weren't exposed to any particular criticism SIS as a firm back then were really supportive um, and we had a we had a great time training with them do you remember the very first day you were let loose on your own? Yeah, I do. Salisbury. It was May 1992. Um, uh, and indeed, the 
obviously the, the anniversary had only just passed. I was back there on the same occasion. I remember it was sounds crazy these days. You know, you try not to stay away from home. You know, because you like your own bed. And yeah, it's a three and a half hour drive home. Fine, I'll do it. But I did Salisbury from home, which was like. 70 miles <laughs> and I went down the morning before just to make sure I knew where I was going the next day I had a pile full of old sporting lives in the back of the car because back then of course there was no internet so you had to back reference the, the colours if you wanted to prep in advance you had to find out the date they last ran dig out the old racing the old sporting life for for the colour description you didn't even get colours printed in the papers then so yeah, I remember ringing my wife saying, I'm here, yeah, yeah, I think I know where the racetrack is, yeah, yeah, and all the rest of it. Sounds crazy now that you would go the morning before uh, the day's racing just to prepare, but that's, that's, that's what happened back then, back, at, back in those days, Salisbury. Willie Carson had a treble, pleased to say, and a lovely horse there, Richard Hammond's called Venture Capitalist, was also a winner there. A lot of people will probably remember him, he was a pretty good horse, so um, yeah, very happy day, good day. So you've done a lot of radio-only commentary as well. Is it the skill set different for that? I think, you know, moving on to um, radio work, Radio 5, I, I was, you, the difference is you, people who are tuning into you obviously may have a certain range of knowledge, but they don't have the full picture. And whereas people flicking on the telly, they can see straight away you're racing on grass, you're racing right to left, that it's a sunny day it's a big field or it's a small field they can compute that instantly can't, as a viewer you can do that can't you but on radio when you're thrown to at Royal Ascot you know no one knows no one knows if it's pouring down is this the Hunt Cup or is this a six runner St James's Palace States and what's the context of all that as well you know so in, with radio work you've got to very quickly a paint the picture and and B, let people know what, what it is they're actually listening to and the significance of that. So I think they're subtle differences, but differences all the same. Okay, and apart from the horse racing, you've also been doing the ozone layering this year with your, your flying around with um, the Winter Olympics and the Commonwealth Games. Um, when did these sort of uh, jobs start coming in? Yeah, a couple of years ago, um, well, more than that now, I, I became the swimming commentator at Radio 5. And I started off the summer of ninety. Uh, so, sorry, of the summer of two thousand thirteen, going to Barcelona, the World Championships there. Great Britain swimmers got one bronze medal then, and I thought, oh god, what have I done here? This is we're absolutely hopeless at this. I'm going to get dropped straight away. But happily, the year after, Adam Peaty and a few others came along, and swimming's strong now. So I really enjoy that. The swimming's. I've, I've gone to say to Barcelona. Uh, hopefully, going to Korea next year. Budapest two Commonwealth Games, a couple of Olympic Games now. So that's been brilliant. And the Winter Olympics was a bit of a bolt from the blue, really. But obviously, Korea, they sent the smallish team for that, asked me if I'd be happy to go. And, mate, I'm, I'm gone 50 now. I'm all for new experiences because opportunities are going to be thinner on the ground than ever before. So, yeah, hand straight up for a bit of um, bobsleigh and skeleton. And, and, and luckily enough, that, that went fairly well as well so again some medals help so yeah all good and I'd, I'd happily do other things if if the opportunity arose. So how does the men's luge compared to the Wokingham? <laughs> the Wokingham's a bit more comfortable I think the yeah the men's luge it was, it was fun but it's just a different thing to do isn't it it's just uh, you know the, with the Wokingham there's 30 of them and it's just you with some, an event like the Men's Luge or the Skeleton, obviously the BBC pair you up with real experts. So I had Amy Williams, who was a gold medalist in the Skeleton, and John Jackson, who was, who was one of our most prominent uh, bobsleigh team members in the last 20 years. So they were an amazing company. So I had a, I had a big deficit in terms of knowledge, but I could, I could describe what's going on and I had a fair bit of enthusiasm as well. So we got away with it anyway. I think the enthusiasm came through on some of the clips over in, the, in those two events. So, um, what were the big, any particular stories from them that you remember, especially the last couple of um, this year? Well, there's a funny one. I'd like to think I'm fairly even tempered, but you have in these events, these luge and bobsleigh events, you have a you have two runs per day, and there's a there's a gap between the two of about 40, 45 minutes. Um, so that's your opportunity to go on a refreshment break, isn't it? So out of that, uh, I told the Racing Post this as well earlier this year, 
So I go, we're in, definitely in the men's luge here, which is an event that's not big in Great Britain, obviously, but in certain parts of Europe in particular, it's absolutely massive. Latvia being a case in point. So I go off for my refreshment break, grab a coffee on the way back, a bit of fruit, got about 15 minutes to spare and I'll amble back to the uh, commentary block, box. Ambling back, the whole stairway was blocked with what were clearly security guards. And I'm thinking, oh, well, I thought there was a, I thought there must have been some security alert. So I hung back a bit and I thought, well, I've only got 10 minutes now, so. I'll, and my commentary box is the other side of these security boys, so I'm going to have to say something. No, you can't come through. I said, look, I said, I said, I know you've clearly got some sort of job to do, but is the event cancelled? You know, what's going on? Anyway, it turns out that the next door commentary box to us was the Latvian broadcasters as well. And the Latvian president, a massive luge fan, had come to do commentary on the final luge run featuring a couple of Latvian guys. And of course, you couldn't, if you weren't already in, you, you couldn't really get in. So we had, we had a couple of anxious diplomatic moments before some kindly big burly Latvian let me through and took pity on me. Saw my BBC badge and away we went. But um, yeah, the, the president of Latvia very nearly brought an end to my BBC luge career. So that was somebody else nearly causing their problems for you. What's been your own biggest Rick? God, there's been a there's been a few of them. Own biggest Rick. I tell you one which horrified me at the time because I didn't know I'd done it was um, and in the in the general scheme of things, none of these things really matter. But you know you want to do your best every time, don't you? But I remember in the uh, Beecher Chase, John Joe Neal had a. a a number of runners, three or four, Cadbury Cross was one of them. Um, and early on, you do the beach chase as a commentator on your own. Uh, whereas in the national, there's three or, in certain circumstances, four of you doing it. So yeah, um, John Joe had all these runners. And for some inexplicable reason, this Cadbury Cross, whatever it's called, fell at the first, purple colors. Uh, and for some reason I've said Clan Royal's down. Clan Royal obviously in the green and the yellow hoops. And for some reason my self-check mechanism just didn't work. So I'd said Clan Royal's fallen, race goes on, Carberry Cross is on the floor. And I no never at any stage during the race um, I'm aware that I've called Clan Royal as a faller. So that was a horrible one because that's a pretty big day that was, the beach chase day. But the worst one, again back at Aintree, was, do you remember two horses called Jeddah and Paris Pike? They ran in the national and they both basically ran in the same colours, give or take a few little, few little differences here and there, both in black. So I'm, they, they go past me, third fence. I think it was the year eight or nine went down at the first and I've confidently said that, that uh, Paris Pike's down at the first. So, <laughs> so then I'm thinking, good, I think I've, I've got six or seven of those eight fallers. That's probably pretty pleased with myself there. And meanwhile, the action's gone on to the other commentators around beaches and Valentines. And when it come back past me on the second circuit, because you can't really hear the commentary either elsewhere of the other lads. And first horse I see coming over the 17th fence away from the stands is, you know, Paris Bike. And I just, I, my just heart sank. But... Like I say, Rick's in running betting, I think, has accentuated Rick's, hasn't it? You know, every word, well, people, people bet in running and, you know, it's always amazed me, but they hang on to what the commentator said rather than watch it for themselves. So, yeah, there's a bit of heat flying around about that, but nothing, nothing too terrible. No, there's, happily, there's been no, there's been no Red Rums won the Grand National when Alverton actually won it. There's been none of those moments. We've got to be positive here. So the most memorable sport event you've commentated on for all the right reasons. Um, oh God, I've been lucky enough to do so many. Racing wise, it seems as though every Cheltenham or every Aintree there's a there's a buzz. So they're very very special events. But away from racing, I think to be honest, the the 2012 Olympics at uh, in London, home games, great venue. I did the equestrian there. Um, before moving on to the swimming and 
some of those moments were fantastic. Really, really, really memorable. Uh, very, very lucky to have done that. Pleased to have done a Wembley game as well, a football match, where I had about an hour and a half's interview with Paolo Di Canio after his Swindon side had lost to Chesterfield. God knows how long that interview would have been had he won it. Is that something you've ever fancied, football commentators? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But it's just time. You, it's, it's A, there's, a, well, there's several reasons. There's a massive group of unbelievably talented commentators who would be well ahead of me in terms of knowledge and ability anyway. But also, you know, football, a bit midweek, but it's all weekends, and weekends is racing as well, so you can't be in two places at once. OK, and finally, John, I did a bit of Googling, as I always do, to research my interviewees. I saw a funny story about you stood to attention in a car park, uh, seemingly ignoring the jockey that was asking if you were OK. What was the story there? <laughs> this, was, this was a Remembrance Sunday driving to Foss Lass, and I, I was particularly pleased with myself because as you come off... As you come off the motorway up through the hills to Foss Lass, it's about a 20 minute drive. You get to parts of the country that are so remote, they're really, really quiet. And I always like to acknowledge Remembrance Day, and in particular Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. So 5 to 11, got Radio 4 on, listening to the coverage of the Remembrance uh, ceremony. Top of a hill, middle of nowhere, very, very happy. Standing by the car, quite competitive, you know, next thing. This big Merc pulls up alongside my car. And I'm thinking, who's this? And <laughs> middle of nowhere, but it's Paul Maloney, the now retired jump jockey. And Paul, Paul never was known for saying a great deal at the best of times, but he says, he stops, he gets, gets out, he goes, he goes, John, are you all right? And of course, I, I, by now, we're into, the, <laughs> we're, into the, we're into the two minute silence, and I've, I've, I've put all this thought into it, and I just sort of don't want to break the two minute silence. I'm going, I'm going. He goes, you sure you're okay? Is your car right? Have you had a, have you had a puncture or anything? <laughs> <laughs> so then, so, then <laughs> so he's asking me all of these questions and then eventually you hear the trumpets go to signal the end of the two minutes. And I said, Paul, I said, I could speak then, of course. And Paul had just explained what I was doing. He smiled, I smiled and away we went. But it was quite a funny few minutes on the hillside in deepest, darkest Wales. Brilliant story. And just finally, finally, we don't see adverts anymore for training racecourse commentators, but if anybody's got the chance, is it a life you'd recommend? Ah, oh, massively. Fantastic fun. I'm amazed there aren't a stack of youngsters wanting to do it because, all right, there's plenty of time away from home. There's lots and lots of travelling, but you meet some amazing people and it's such a buzz to do the job. But, yeah, anybody out there who even half thinks they might be good at it, should really give it a go. Loads of practice early, go to point to points, go to your local meeting and just have a practice to yourself in, in a quiet corner of the stand somewhere. Um, we need the youngsters coming through, that's for sure. There's too many of us, 50 somethings, who will be out in our ear in a few years time. So big opportunity for youngsters to be commentators. Brilliant, thank you very much, John. Pleasure.